Hello everyone, my name is Yvonne Grant. Welcome and thank you for joining our Diabetes YouTube Education channel. Today our session is about why should you check your blood sugar? I would like to personally ask why do you check your blood sugar? Because uh, your doctor said so? Um, Many of you have expressed in your training and coaching sessions that you don't understand why you need to check your blood sugar and there is lots of conflicting information on whether or not you actually need to check. Particularly for those with type 2 diabetes, many have asked, well, why do you actually check it? And the analogy I would like to use today is when you get into your car, what if you didn't have a dashboard. What if all you did was sit in your car, put your seat belt on, have no guide of direction, whether or not you're going forward or in reverse, whether or not you have enough gas, or how fast you're going. There is no guide, no dashboard to really suggest how you're doing and what you need to improve. The presentation approach that we are using for our series of training sessions is modeled from pilots who learn from other pilots' mistakes. And our session today implements a problem-solving approach. And for those of you who want to know, well, who could derive benefit from this session today? And you can and will derive benefit if you have type 2 diabetes, uh, often experience both high and low blood sugar and within the same day. If you don't fundamentally understand why your blood sugar is high, what are the factors that contributed to it being high or low, and if you're awful, like many of you are, afraid to eat because you're in fear of getting your blood sugar high, or if you're a caregiver and you support someone who has type 2 diabetes. Utilizing our problem-solving approach, the case we will talk about today is from MJ. And MJ has shared her story with a hope that you can learn from her experience. She's a 43-year-old female with three children. She has had type 2 diabetes for three years and struggles to manage her blood sugar. She often gets upset when her sugar is high as she's often confused, not sure why it becomes high. And fairly often, to compensate for the high blood sugar, she's afraid to eat because of concerns for high blood sugar readings. Um, this particular day, MJ woke up at around 7.38 in the morning. Her blood sugar was equal to 104. What should it be? What should be your blood sugar when you get up? Your blood sugar first thing in the morning is considered fasting, and by the guidelines set by the ADA, or American Diabetes Association, typically a blood sugar for an adult with type 2 diabetes is less than 120 first thing in the morning. This depends on the individual's age and other chronic conditions that they may have. Your doctor will set your goals and your guidelines for a safe blood sugar that's appropriate for you. After checking, MJ ate her breakfast at around 7.30, and for breakfast, you'll see here, she had a cup of strawberries equal to 16 strawberries. She loves pancakes, and with a good blood sugar, she thought it appropriate, and it would be a good day to have pancakes, so she had five pancakes with fruit topping and jelly. She also had two eggs for her protein, as well as tomatoes and three strips of bacon. Additionally, she had her favorite cup of coffee. She considered, in all, a healthy breakfast for a healthy and really good blood sugar in target range. We'll then take a look six and a half hours later around lunchtime. Her blood sugar is now 234. And as usual, she's very upset, not being quite sure why her blood sugar is high. Let's 
evaluate and dissect and really look at what happened. She got up, her blood sugar was 104. She took her medications that were prescribed for her with her breakfast. And then at 1.30, uh, around lunchtime, she exceeds 200 with a exact blood sugar of 234. What should it be? What are the guidelines? The recommended guideline and blood sugar before lunch and dinner should be less than 140. One hour after a meal, from the start of the meal, it can be as high as 180 and is considered within the target range. However, two hours after a meal, it should be back to being less than 140. So for MJ's next meal, she decided that she wasn't going to have any carbohydrate with that meal. She just had a glass of water and you'll see here on her plate, she had lettuce and tomato, no dressing. And then hours later, around 7.30 in the evening, her blood sugar is now at 64. Again, let's go back, take a look. She got up at breakfast, sugar was good. She had strawberries, a cup of strawberries, considered 16 large strawberries about four strawberries depending on the size and at this size is considered a serving of carbohydrate and so since she had uh, 16 strawberries and four per serving of carbohydrate she had four servings of carbohydrate with the strawberries and she additionally had uh, five pancakes and with the sugar content in the pancakes, each pancake is considered a serving of carbohydrate as well. Also, she had her coffee and with the sugar content, the cup of coffee is a serving of carbohydrate. So uh, if we total her carbohydrate intake, uh, we see a one for the coffee, five for the pancake, four for the strawberries, and that totals 10 servings of carbohydrates. So it should not be shocking or surprising that her sugar is higher than it should be before her next meal. She had five times the recommended amount of carbohydrate for breakfast. Now let's look at how she may have modified breakfast to keep her sugar from becoming high before lunch. She's trying really hard and our goal is to support her to fundamentally understand what she did wrong so she could improve it in the future. She's desperate to achieve better blood sugar control and sincerely so. So on this next slide, if you note, if, if MJ had had just one pancake and eliminated the strawberry plus the cup of coffee, that would be equivalent to her two servings, one for the coffee and one for the pancake. And it's recommended at least two servings of carbohydrate with each meal. That would have been a healthier breakfast. The eggs, the bacon, and the tomatoes don't really count towards the carbohydrate content. So we'll note here that her carbohydrate intake exceeded the recommended two servings, and consequently, the higher blood sugar reading prior to lunch. Now, for lunch, you notice she didn't have any carbohydrates, and before dinner, she was low. Now, if she had not had dinner around 7.30, let's say she had to work late or even run later, getting home, traffic or otherwise, she could have run into serious trouble with very low blood sugars. A better choice would have been having a lunch with one or two servings of carbohydrates. And options might be a slice of uh, salmon, a cup of mashed potatoes, and some vegetables. That should be on her plate. And there are diagrams here that gives you an idea of the proportions and the content that should actually be on your plate. So to summarize, going back to MJ, it's fundamental that you use your blood sugar as a guide. A guide for asking questions as 
What is my blood sugar? If it's fasting first thing in the morning, that's typically less than 120. And in her case, it was within the acceptable range. As she made a choice whether she limited her carbohydrate intake based on guidelines, she would have achieved a controlled blood sugar reading prior to lunch. And if she had also chosen two servings of carbohydrate with meal at lunch, you can envision that her blood sugar prior to dinner would also be at goal. And so here, as we have illustrated, the blood sugar readings are important in guiding decisions about what to eat and the proportions and to achieve a sustainable blood sugar control. Again, the message here, it's important to check your blood sugar and it should not be just aimlessly done, but it should be done with a purpose in having questions where you ask, what is my blood sugar? What is the comparison, meaning what should it be? And what does it mean? And it should guide your decisions of whether or not you're achieving your target goal. And these goals are often set by your primary care provider that might be slightly different depending on how many chronic diseases there might be, your age, and how physically active you are. Today, we primarily wanted to take you through the case of MJ and the choices and decisions that can be guided by blood sugar readings and the ability to learn from them. To conclude, the key points I'd like to make are that you should check your blood sugar to guide what decisions you make. It is important to have carbohydrate with each meal. And it's important to limit the servings of carbohydrate to prevent high blood sugar readings. If you have additional questions regarding nutrition, as many of you do in your cultural foods and how they can be adapted to be healthier and safer for your blood sugar control, Feel free to send me your questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for joining. Please subscribe so we can send you an alert for the next session and the topic to be covered. Thanks again for your participation. Looking forward to next time. Take care.